You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Stagwardy game. Who's first? I'll go first if you like. Okay. Do you fancy it? Okay. It's the leisure and business pursuits of the rich and famous. Mm. All right. Five examples. One fictitious, but which? This is for you to divine. Okay. Phil Collins amassed over 200 items of memorabilia related to the Battle of the Alamo. That's one. Yeah. Jack White's vast array of taxidermy includes stuffed gazelles, antelopes, a giraffe, and an elephant's head. <laughs> okay. Tom Bailey of the Thompson Twins owns a racehorse in New Zealand called Doctor Doctor. Terminator X of Public Enemy has a black ostrich stud farm in North Carolina. And Grandmaster Flash has a collection of 5,000 mugs. <laughs> One of those things isn't true, but the rest, the rest, astonishingly, are true. So there we are. We got any clues? I, I do, I do. I know Phil Collins definitely does collect stuff about the. Yeah, album. he does. He Big does. Enthusiast. Yeah, so yeah. what's the what's the second one? Was Jack so White? Jack White's, uh, you know, gazelles, antelopes, giraffes, and <laughs> <laughs> huge collection of taxidermy. There's, there's Tom Bailey. With his, his, his see, I, can't, I, I kind of think that if Tom Bailey had a racehorse called Doctor Doctor, it would have been it would be a late racehorse. You know, it would be this would be quite a while ago. But anyway, go on, Karen. The fourth one was so it was Terminator X has a black ostrich stud farm in North <laughs> Carolina. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> and the last one was Grandmaster Flash with his five thousand months. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'm going to pick Grandmaster Flash. All oh, right, no, no, that's true. That is true. Oh, no, the one, the, the ringer is Tom Bailey. Tom Bailey, who actually does live, I think, I think he does live he in New does Zealand. He does live in New Zealand, and yeah. I think he's a very successful DJ. I think he's done. And Tom Bailey and Alana Curry, my God, they must have would have made a lot of money. I mean, the Thompson Twins were huge and huge in America too. So I think he's probably quite well set up and just noodles about doing the old bit of DJ. But no, he doesn't have a racehorse called Doctor Doctor. <laughs> so he never did have a racehorse. I never did. And never did. Go on. So, what do you got? That's very good. Okay. Uh, the the genre is skate punk. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Skate punk. That's good. Think kind of baggy shorts. Uh, yeah. And uh, grazed knees and uh, uh, punk thrash. Okay. Okay. So these are five groups, five skate punk groups, but one of them was supplied by me okay these are the five dead fucking last <laughs> good riddance yep asphalt gash no use for a name and rich kids on lsd those are those, great those, those five are... again those five again dead fucking last good riddance Asphalt Gash, three miles from them after the news. New use for a name and rich kids on LSD. Those are really good. No use for a name, I think, is is got to be real. It has to be because um, that's very clever and very arch. As I think is rich kids on LSD because that's precisely what people think skate punks are in America. Um, dead fucking last is brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. It's between that asphalt. <laughs> Ashfield Gash. Yeah, that sounds it could be made. Oh, these are so hard, aren't they? I mean, I I think it's probably good riddance because good riddance is so kind of weedy and feeble and, and English and, and it doesn't sound remotely like it fits into the whole American skate punk genre. So I'm going for good riddance, but I'm bound to be wrong. You are wrong. You are wrong. I know. Uh, so where do good riddance come from? Do they come from Croydon or sort of, <laughs> you know, from Virginia Water, more likely? Actually. Dead fucking Home. last. Okay, these are real. Dead fucking last. Good riddance. No use for a name. And rich kids on LSD. The one that's not real, made up by me 10 minutes ago. Ashfeld Ash Ash Gash. Oh, that's very good. That's very okay. good. You it's win. Not it's not <laughs> bad, is it? No, that's really, really good. That's fantastic. Uh, People, I, I understand the the concept of the uh, the Stackwaddy game has been has been uh, taken up elsewhere. I, the people have been getting in touch with me, saying, "Where can I get a list of long list of names? I'd like to play this with my um, with my nearest and dearest at Christmas." Oh right, it's now it's our Yuletide uh, entertainment. Isn't yeah, it? Along and with I, Boulder Dash and Boggle. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a go. This. Let's play the Stackwaddy game, Dad. And uh, we should be putting out a book. 
You should, Dave, along with your quiz book. You should yeah. stack Wardy special. Yeah. I That's can't, great. It, it doesn't really work because, you see, as I said to these, somebody who was in touch with, this, with me this week, hoping I had a long list of categories and band names and so forth, you kind of have to tailor it to the people you're playing with. And in your in our case, I'm playing with you. Absolutely. So I kind of I kind of know the things you'd know and the things you might be able to yeah. sneak through. You know what I mean? You, yeah, you absolutely. Kind of, you know the level of the people you're playing with. And it wouldn't be wouldn't be any point giving the average family group five skate punk groups. Wouldn't work at all. Yes, yeah, yeah, you try to get Gran involved. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a game for all the family. Dead fucking last. <laughs> it's not a game it for all the oh, family. It's very fun. Somebody told me that some uh, podcast is now using it. I can't remember which one it was now. It's now appropriated this idea too. We shall find out who it is and reveal them. Actually, it's very flattering that they do. Good. It, it's very flattering. But obviously, they'll be hearing from our legal representatives. Yeah, my learned friends. And then... So in the light of uh, this weekend's political news, and uh, it struck me there are two dramas uh, about behind the scenes in politics that are available to stream on demand, you know, and very often I go, go back to them. And here's my question to you. Which is the truest to the actual nature of politics? Is it the West Wing or is it the thick of it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I end up watching both of them, you know, and um, and when when it catch all this we all this uh, stuff at Downing Street uh, this weekend involving, I can't believe it involves ball blokes called Lee actually somehow it all sounds like a it ought to be a fight between painter painters and decorators, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. There's Lee and Allegra and uh, and Dom and all these and Boris and all these people and I think what what's truest to the nature of politics, is it the thick of it, or is it the West? Wing? I don't know that much about the West Wing. I know a lot about the thick of it. I've seen all those episodes in the movie. I've got it hundreds of times. I mean, that the thick of it is very clever and it identifies the idea that it's all about it's all about your own personal career, isn't it? It's about trying to find something to represent will get you in the news and further your reputation and profile mm. but without any remote interest in the community that you're meant to be representing. And uh, you can't help but feeling there's a lot of truth in that. The days of vocational politics is kind of, is, is that long over? When we were lads, Dave, people used to, you felt that people signed up to be politicians because they had a genuine philanthropic, <coughs> altruistic reason to be involved. Did, am I right? Uh, the people tend to kind of slide in now, make their names, and slide out and do something else. And make I, them I, 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 I mean, if we're honest about it, I think, I think that the majority of people who enter Parliament have, you know, perfectly honourable intentions. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But you, we get they get involved in the in the in the same game as everybody else, which is all about you know who can get in the news tomorrow and yeah, yeah, precisely who who. Who can whose spin is slightly better than anybody else? I think that probably that one of the reasons, one of the differences between the people who represented us when we were sort of teenagers or you know in our twenties or whatever is largely they'd been through a war. <laughs> yeah, they'd been in the services. They had some experience of of command of leading people. You know, and that applied to Labour and it applied to Conservative and Liberals. You know, um, whereas I look. I look at some people nowadays, and I think you're very, very smart, but you know nothing about life at all. You know what I mean? You know, you know about uh, the thick of it world. You know, you're you're really good at the thick of it world, but the, the, entirely the, the, about spin. The yeah, absolutely. Is, is, yeah, is, yeah. You know, so we shall. Um, we should continue to watch with interest. And the thick of it is still absolutely fantastic. It's absolutely, but you can watch that again and again. You again. can, so, you really so can. And the other thing that amazed me about it is the, 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 the degree to which they must be improvising. And if they are improvising, how clever that is. You know, Rebecca Front, Chris Anderson, you know, they're, they're astonishing, just these just riffs that they go off in. 
and uh, uh, I was, it's absolutely exemplary. I was watching last Sunday <coughs> after we recorded the podcast. I thought, oh, I'm going to wonder what's happening to the remembrance service because obviously there won't be a load of people there, you know, yeah, there on the there telly. Wasn't. And then, you know, so it was it, the ceremony was there, but obviously without without a crowd. And I couldn't help thinking every time I see kind of new politicians suddenly, you know, they enter the little, you know, the, the wreath laying line. I can't th- help thinking of that wonderful scene in the thick of it where Rebecca Front is talked through how to how to lay a wreath, isn't she? By yes, a, right. By a special advisor <laughs> walking up and down this conference room holding a book, I think, or something. Yeah. Telephone directory or whatever. And it's absolutely beautifully done. That I'd say it's terribly good. It's so, genius. Well, what else were we, we were talking about? Bob, Bo Diddley. Oh, Bo, Bo Diddley. I, to, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Bob we, Diddley. We occasionally, Bob Diddley. We re, we we uh, we reboot our um, our old uh, podcasts uh, and, uh, and re-promote them. And I've been going through some the other day, and I found one from two thousand eight where we talked about Bo Diddley. And what an amazing story he is, isn't it? Incredible. And our conjecture then was: Did Bo Diddley? Invent rock and roll. There's also a whole thing about whether he invented gangster rap, but did he invent rock and roll? And I, 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 well, I'm, I'm keen to hear your opinion about this because you know he was there in the 1940s playing in street bands, wasn't he? You know, the band called the Hipsters, was it? They became the Langley Avenue Jive Cats, and he had Jerome Green playing maracas, and he had a you know washtub, um, washtub bass, and another guitar. And uh, they got some gigs in the early 1950s in, in Maxwell Street, I think, in in, in um, in Chicago, playing their old Louis Jordan song. So there's obviously a bridge between rhythm and blues and blues, and old Muddy Waters songs, and rock and roll. But a lot of it's to do with when he got a drummer, wasn't it? Because they got a drummer and a bassist in 1951. So, I mean, would that be earlier than Rocket 88? When did Rocket 88 come Oh, out? good question. Don't Late know. 40, uh, no, it probably that. might be mm, no early 50s, I would have thought. Maybe early 50s, because that's generally considered the to be the first that, rock and roll. The thing that struck me, because I was listening to a bunch of this stuff this morning, I, I got my copy of... CD copy of Bo Diddley as a gunslinger. Here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One of my uh, many, um, many favorite Bo, Bo Diddley yeah. covers. And if you go and listen to these records, A, they sound fantastic. And B, they don't really sound like rock and roll. They sound like, well, he used to, he called it jungle music, didn't he? Yeah. Um, at the time, because he said he wanted African to do, beat. Wanted to do something different from what anybody else was doing. Yeah. And the, and the thing that probably he was the godfather of more than rock and roll was hip hop. You know, in terms of it's all about sound, it's all about texture of sound. Because if you listen to those Bo Diddley records, they sound better than the Chuck Berry records that were, were made in the, in the 1950s in the same studios. There's something about the sound of Bo Diddley records that really warm and vibrant. And um, and also it was this invention of the of the character of Bo Diddley, wasn't it? Because obviously he wasn't Bo Diddley; he was Alice McDaniel. Yeah. And uh, and then and then doing much that hinged of, around a song called "Hey Bo Diddley," was it? I mean, you know, so it's then, self mythologizing. Well, absolutely, and that's something that carried on, didn't it, with Public Enemy and Fifty Cent and all the, all these kind of people. Completely. It's, it's N.W.A. Turning, Turning yourself into a, into a um, into a larger than life figure in Bodley Diddley's case with a kind of rectangular guitar, or you know, stone, he used to make his own instruments, didn't he? Yeah. And so it, it all built up in the, into this cartoon character. Yeah. And um, I was just looking at his discography this morning, and and I don't think there's many people who did as many songs or albums which were about himself. So he started off with Bo Diddley. That being successful, he did Hey Bo Diddley. That's still going well. He decided to do Diddley Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> then he took a slight left turn to take note of Jerome Green, his, his maracas player and kind of mucker. And his next one was Bring It to Jerome. And then he did this thing that I've got here, this CD, this well, obviously an LP in its day. Bo Diddley is a gunslinger. Uh, when the tide of fashion in music changed slightly in the early 60s, he was the first one to do Bo Diddley's a twister. Because, <laughs> you know, obviously. Just got to keep on top of the Vogue. Yeah. Uh, he did Bo Diddley and Company, 
Bo Diddley is a lover. And then, of course, surf him with Bo Diddley. <laughs> I, I prick. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, uh, there is no documentary evidence of Bo Diddley ever putting so much as a toe in the water, <laughs> let, a, let alone hanging 10, <laughs> you know. Out that is there. fantastic. But he, he he wasn't above doing that. So fun with Bo Diddley, uh, and uh, you know even even quite late in his in his career, his recording life, he was doing uh, Big Bad Bo and Bo Diddley is crazy, you know. So it's all it's all just building up this kind of viz entire factory, but and it's all self mythologies. That it's pretty what a grand tradition. It's fantastic. There was a lot of it. And uh, Manfred Mann. Well, yes. A lot of people pinch the the British the R and B R and B bands of the early sixties. They pinched that idea from Bob Diddley. The yeah. idea that you wrote a song about yourself because the animals are a song called the story of Bo Diddley, didn't they? The story of Bo Diddley, which in mentions, w- I think, the, the mop tops. Is that right? And then but the in in, the- in which the animals appear. Yeah, they're that- playing in a night. They go to a nightclub where Bo Diddley yeah, yeah, in Newcastle. Uh, That's right. <laughs> And they, they just they they fact you know, describe some kind of exchange with Bo Diddley, um, and it was obviously just their way of saying we're not just a bunch of oiks from Newcastle. Yeah, we we also come trailing clouds of glory. So you know we um we do the story of Bo Diddley and we put ourselves in it, and of course them the first them album has that's the, right has the story of them in which Van Morrison kind of intones the tale of uh, how them got together in the Maritime Hotel in, in Belfast or wherever it was. Yeah, yeah. And loads of people did it. You may remember... Hey, hey, with the monkeys. 10th uh, Avenue, Avenue freeze out. Doesn't well, no, mention? we come to, come to that in a second. <coughs> yeah. Come to that in a second. Do you know the one in the middle by Man From Man? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just the one oh, in the great. middle. Mike Hogg played, played the drums that... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, it, Tom McGinnis played the diamond bass. Is that the one? Man from Man plays the organ. Yeah. Tom McGuinness holds it down on bass. But the one in the middle sings Hey Diddle Diddle because he's, just, he's a just a pretty face. <laughs> Fantastic. It was, a, it was a bit of a hit, that was. A huge hit. So, and that was actually and five, done. four, three, two, one. Uh-huh, it was the Manfreds. That's right. It's the same thing, wasn't it? I suppose so. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, with the Manfreds. God, I hadn't thought of that. That's true. But then um, you get the, then there's the monkeys, and then there's yeah, there's Tenth Avenue Freezer, which I think mentions the the big man joining the band. There's a yeah, bit of it's about the story of the group getting together, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's a Leonard Cohen song called uh, Field Commander Cohen, not about him, but it's the idea that he casts himself into the role of a kind of spy espionage piece, doesn't he? And uh, there's My Name Is Prince, and I am funky. That's a bit of a calling card. <laughs> Do you remember Devo, all that stuff? Are, 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 we, are, men? We, not, are we not are men? We, not we men. are Devo. Are I can we remember 5,000-word articles in the enemy about what devolution meant, the idea of mankind regressing, etc. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, NWA, lots of that from NWA, MC Ren and Easy E. And, uh, one of my favourite, and Slim Shady. That's a kind of, uh, again, kind of, uh, and, and the Ant Rap, Dave. Okay. Marco Merrick, <laughs> Terry Lee, Gary Tibbs, and yours truly. Is that, how, is, that, is that how he goes? Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> Do that again. It's Marco Merrick, Terry, uh, Terry Lee, Gary Tibbs, and yours truly. <laughs> In the naughty north and the sexy south, uh, we're all singing and I am the mouth or something. It's some absolutely <laughs> weird thing, isn't it? My favourite of, 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 of any of any group writing a song about themselves was one, was one by the monochrome set. Do you remember the You probably don't uh, yeah, yeah, I do know the monochrome set. Yeah, Leicester Square, play guitar. And they had a song called the Mar- and the chorus went the monochrome set, the monochrome set, the monochrome set, the monochrome set. And that was that was the chorus. And the backing vocal was on the word the. So all the rest of the group, I remember seeing them playing it live, it was wonderful. They'd all step forward to the back and just go, the monochrome set, the monochrome set. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant and original and extraordinary? But I, I bet if you had to give a prize to the one that still um is most powerful as an idea. It's hey hey with the monkeys. Hey it? hey with the monkeys, completely. Because if you, we're just you, monkeying around, you just, you just have to say hey hey, we're the and you, you're off, aren't you? Yeah. And um, we're too we're too busy singing to, to put, put anybody, anybody down. down. <laughs> we're just trying to be friendly. 
come and hear us sing and play. We're the young generation, and we've, we've got, got something, something to say. To say. <laughs> <laughs> the Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. I had a classic example the other day of how having too many records drives you mad, Mark. And I don't know if you'd, uh, if you'd sympathize with this. I, I, I've got too many records, okay? It's, it's a fact, isn't it? No I, such thing as too many records. All oh, right, but I've got a lot of records. And I've got a lot of CDs over there, all in drawers and you know, stuff all over the house. And it's, it's kind of organized, but it's not exact. Anyway, because having a load of records is not enough, is it? I, I also subscribe to streaming services so I can listen to even <laughs> more stuff, you know. And in the course of the streaming services, do things like if you play something and you get to the end of it, it will just, you know, nominate something that's a bit like it, that, you might, that it's found via its algorithms that people who like this like that. And you're down uh, an endless rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I just happened to be listening to something and I hadn't intended to. And I found myself listening to, I thought, that's Ali Farkaturi, isn't it? Surely. Ali Farkaturi, the kind of Marley and blues man. And, uh, and I was listening to this. Oh, God, this is good. Oh, this is good. I've got, what's more, I've got this. I've got this record. Now, it wasn't enough for me to be, I had access to it on the stream. No, I've got this record. I've got it somewhere. It's on CD. I'm going to sure. go and find it. So, I, and, and honestly, Mark, uh, I, I spent, I was just going up and downstairs for two hours. I just couldn't settle to anything at all. But and isn't I was it like, fair to say that with the record collection, was, your size, that if it's not in alphabetical order, where are you going to find <laughs> your alphabetical <laughs> You might as well go start looking in the garden. I mean, well, yeah. it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> the Ali Fakaturi, you got, you got. It's a triple threat, there, isn't it? Is it Ali? Oh, is it yeah, Parker? Yeah. Is it Tory? Is it Tory? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then you think, well, no, some of that stuff, I I tend to put it in a drawer uh, with with kind of world music or instrumental music or stuff that doesn't readily fall into any category and doesn't easily obey the alphabet and all that sort of stuff. And so I went to those places, couldn't find it, could not find it, got everything out, couldn't find it. I, was, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't settle. It's just ridiculous. Couldn't do any work, couldn't read anything. I, I, I just Life this, falling this. apart. <laughs> and then eventually I found it, you know, filed upside down. There it is. I love Hakuturi, the King of the Desert Blues Singers. Uh, is is a record called Savan, and I've been playing it ever since. You must I, have been so relieved. You oh, must have hugged it. You must have been in tears. Oh, you must have been having a little party for one up in the attic, dancing to this magnificent record. I'm reminded of the the old the old parable from the Bible about you know the shepherd spends more time looking for the one that is lost. Than, than he spends dealing with the hundreds that he's got, you know. <laughs> uh, that, uh, so that's what I couldn't help thinking of. And God, I was relieved because I thought, if I don't, if I keep searching all day and I don't have it, I'm going to have to order it. I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know. I can listen to it, streaming service, I can listen to it any time I want, you know. But Why thought, do you need to actually have it? Because I just do, because, okay, this is it. So that's because, an interesting thing, because if you want to listen to it, it doesn't make any difference whether it's in your household no, or not. Okay, well, this is my answer. And this is part of the reason why I'm going to come, you know, like I was rat rattling on about this the other week when we were talking about, you know, my theory, the CD will kind of come back. It'll never come back quite like vinyl, but it'll come back, you know. Because once you decide you love something... Yeah, you want to have it. You want it. That's true. You want to have it. To kind of prove that you love it. <laughs> yeah. something else. And so I thought, if I don't have that, I'm going to have to do something about it. And I'm also going to feel bad about myself that did I have it and did I let it go? Which would be a terrible, you know... A stain on my character, wouldn't it? If they, well, you could have given it to somebody. You could have given it to somebody and turned them on to an entire lifetime of world music enthusiasm. Well, maybe I don't do that kind of thing. No, 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 no. I, don't, I, don't, I don't give records to people actually. But uh, anyway, I just thought you might you might be. Uh, 
I've you might relate to, to that. You know. I'm just trying to imagine what what sort of state you'd be like if you if you'd be in if you hadn't found it. Oh, I went sleepless I, I, misery. We, we wouldn't be haunted. Doing this, we wouldn't be doing this podcast now. I would have been up all <laughs> night. You know. <laughs> Taken everything out of the house and put it out in the garden and sorted through it once one thing at the <laughs> time until I found it. So anyway. So this so, week, go on, we've been Well, I was gonna say I was I wanted to mention Lloyd Cole. Yes, we, we well, talked to Lloyd Cole the other time. We talked to a um, load of people this week, haven't we? We talked yeah. to we talked to um uh, John Kosh. Uh of, I think that's up and out, doesn't it? That's John up Kosh and out, but people if you if you haven't uh, caught that, do catch that. It was the man who designed Abbey Road and loads of other things. Anyway, go on. We also no, talked Lloyd to Cole, Lloyd Cole. It was really interesting. Lloyd Cole, here he is in lockdown. He lives in Massachusetts, um, in lockdown, like, 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 like the rest of us, and um, suddenly got some interest from people in his lyrics, in, his, in the idea of his handwritten lyrics. And he told us that he gets up in the morning and he spends a considerable amount of time now rewriting presumably in a fine italic nib, um, you know, the, the the lyrics to Perfect Skin or whatever it is, and then uh, sells them uh, to people who've got in touch with them. Why not? I oh, thought that was a really interesting idea. It's a really interesting idea. And there's very heard. reason. I can't remember what it was. It was $75 or something like that for a handwritten manuscript. Also, it would be customised to you. It would have a little message to you at the top, presumably. Presumably. I don't think not. he does that thing where he pretends it's the original version and scratches some words out and puts other ones in. Or, you know, I don't think he's anything as arch as that. But, I mean, the idea that, that, that you could – it just made me think there's a huge industry there. Because if you like somebody, you'd love to have handwritten lyrics. No, I, I never I mean, thought – I've never thought of that until he, he talked about it. Yeah. Because we've all heard stories about, you know, Don McLean famously uh, happily he found. Down. Just suddenly stumbled <laughs> across like you looking for your Alifarka Tory record. <laughs> suddenly found, amazingly, you know, in some cupboard somewhere, the uh, the lyric to American Pie. It was sold for a no, enormous... It sold for about $1.1 $1. $1 million. And, and just the, how extraordinary, two weeks later, he found Vincent. <laughs> what I mean, what are the chances? Isn't that astonishing? <laughs> Whereas Lloyd oh, no, isn't no. doing anything like that. That's oh, no, no, no. A, I mean, what Lloyd's doing is kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's a development of, of selling of your autograph isn't it really it you is know, it's, 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 it's your autograph it's all it is but uh, if it's a song you particularly like you no fair enough idea. fair enough and actually you know i just thought there ought to be a roaring trade in um in old motel stationery that's what you want you know if you could find a cache yeah. of old holiday in notepads upon which you then rewrite yeah. upon which you, you put <laughs> right, mr tambourine stain. man yeah. that's right <laughs> that's right it's just come to me you know and then I mean? so sort of, you know, put a coffee stain on it <laughs> a cigarette <laughs> burn it's got like a rolling ball crossed out Stone, that's it whatever that's um, it uh, that's what you need to, to add further authenticity if you're trying to pass off these things as as being what you, what you wrote at the time. No, I was intrigued by this. Of course, I, I was just um, when we were talking about it. You know how Muhammad Ali made his living for the last kind of 20 years of his life was selling his autograph because it, it, it was the only thing that it could generate any money, you know, because there's fighters a fighter, you know. <laughs> You, you could know, argue that the more you sell your autograph, the less it, the less its value uh, uh, retains. I don't know. Does it, well, he, not? he apparently used to, uh, you know, obviously he was he battled the illness of um, you know, for a long, long time. But he used to go to a kind of public place, and he he would he would sign autographs. You know, I think pretty much daily. And um, I'm just looking. There is such there is so many Muhammad Ali autographs out there. That there is a very good website called aliautos.com, which calls itself the greatest Muhammad Ali autograph resource. And it, it will, it will, it has large sections on forgeries, and it will it will give you a quick opinion on whether the autograph you've got really is, is really is an Ali autograph. Um, so they can't be worth they can't be worth an awful lot of money, surely not. I can't if there's that many of them. I don't think so. No, no, no. no. But I love the idea of, of, of musicians kind of diversifying. I still love the idea of Dylan and his welding. I mean, he doesn't do that as a commercial enterprise, but he does have his studio, doesn't he, in Los Angeles, where he welds. Now, and wouldn't he you, artifacts that you, wouldn't know, that you, you buy? Could buy. <laughs> wouldn't you buy 
If you could, you know, if you could, if you're the kind of person who is going to spend money on a on a wrought iron gate, garden gate, or whatever, how forgive me, cool would it be to be able to say, "Do you like it, Bob Dylan made Bob that. Bob Dylan made it. That's really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, incredibly I'd, exciting. I'd rather have that than one of his paintings. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Absolutely. Yes, it's a useful thing, you know. But presumably, once you've announced that that's a, a gate made by Bob Dylan, then the security of that gate is then very threatened. <laughs> I and, suppose uh, it might get nicked. I would imagine. Does You're... Dylan make his own things? I remember when he had a, he had a, a, an exhibition at the is it Halcyon Gallery, I think, uh, in in London in two thousand and thirteen. And the director said, Dylan designs the works and decides which objects will be used. He does some of the welding himself, but he has one or two people to help him out. And he's intimately involved with the whole process. So I think it's probably one of those kind of Damien Hirst, um, yeah. you know, Anselm Kiefer things where you've got yeah. a big, yeah. big factory turning stuff out. But, but it's yeah. I loved, I think it's brilliant. What a fantastic See, I idea think it's there is with all these old car, car hubs. And, uh, some rock you know. star ought to start making something that we all want, like garden gnomes or something like that. Yeah. You know? Something we could all just plonk down in the, in the garden and go, do you know who made that? <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne. Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Haywood of Haircut 100. <laughs> that one over there is Les Neems. Les <laughs> Neems. <laughs> Lovely idea. Oh, that's good. <laughs> this is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So here we are back again, this time joined uh, by Alex Gold, who's, who's just told us that, that uh, Des O'Connor's death's been announced uh, at the age of 88. And uh, Alex said, what did you say, Alex? Uh, but, uh, Des O'Connor toured with Buddy Holly. And he did. Obviously, he was in those days, you know, those kind of shows, they always had a compare. They always had to have a comic, you know. And uh, But what amazed me, because I just looked it up, is just how many shows they did. Shall I go through these shows? This was a UK tour, right, obviously. UK tour. Of in 58? Yeah. 58. So he was probably, I'm trying to think, he was probably the first of those kind of rock and rollers to come over. Anyway. Start, the tour starts the Elephant and Castle Trocadero, then the Kilburn Gaumont State, Southampton Gaumont, Sheffield City Hall, Stockton Globe, Newcastle City Hall, Wolverhampton Gaumont, Nottingham Odeon, Bradford Gaumont, Birmingham Town Hall, Worcester Paramount, Croydon Davis, East Ham Granada, Woolwich Granada, Ipswich Gaumont, Leicester de Montfort Hall, Doncaster Gaumont, Wigan Ritz, Hull Regal, Liverpool Philharmonic, Philharmonic Hall, Walthamstow, Granada, Salisbury, Gaumont, Bristol, Colson Hall, and Cardiff Capital and Hammersmith. Isn't that amazing? Wow. That's a lot of, lot of London. That was like a classic bit of old radio that day, you know, from 30 years ago, where people actually used to read out tour dates on the radio. Right. Made riveting radio, but then you didn't, you didn't have the information any other way. But so that was is. a lot of shows, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Incredible. Is that it was just, a lot is, of shows. Is the volume of London shows in that run slightly unusual? What, no, probably, it's, Elephant, uh, it's probably not that unusual, really, um, yeah. because you, you wouldn't be. You, no, they they were people would play more than one London show, um, and they and and there weren't there weren't big venues. You know, there wasn't a Wembley alternative or anything like that. You know, these places were all, what, however many there were, two and a half thousand, if that. Probably not even that actually. Um, but I hadn't realised just how many shows that was. So, Des O'Connor, um, you know, that, was, that would uh, be a good bill. Des O'Connor, good value. Yeah, I'm sure. Terrific. I'm sure. And uh, and also up there with Bob Monkhouse, all those people who were kind of kind of ignored for a long time and thought of us being um, kitsch and uh, and uh, you know cheesy. Suddenly he's kind of given a certain amount of light entertainment uh, respect. And also. Uh, the thing that kind of made Dezo kind of famous all over again was he was the butt of uh, of all Morgan Mo- Mo- Wise's jokes. Wasn't That's it? right, it was. They, they just they just had to put Dezo Connor, the name Dezo Connor, into any line, and it was immediately funny. And also, he had some hit records, didn't he? Do you remember One Two Three O'Leary? I don't. Oh, that's a big hit. He had more than one. Well, yeah, that's why they used to take the mickey out of him because he sold a lot of records. I yeah, think, you know, and they, they kind of sing along with Des. 
something like Max Bygroves did. Well, so 88, uh, you know, decent in, in decent innings. innings, very good innings. Uh, good yeah, man. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Uh, so also, Alex, was, was you were inspired by a mention of Don McLean's American Pie to tell us that that is one of the one of your staples in your in your if you had to play for your life in a hostile pub yeah uh, that's one of the songs you do go and tell us about that well it serves two purposes actually um one is it's about 10 minutes long and if you play it a little bit slowly you've basically got 15 minutes of your set covered um, <laughs> And in champagne supernova, and you, you, you're nearly there. That's it. That's the, that's the, you collect the money and go home. Absolutely, but also it's one of these magical songs that um, just appears to make people participate, no matter where you are, who you're playing in front of, what time of day it is, what state of inebriation or non people are in. It's just got that sort of magical formula that that makes people sing without realizing they're doing it. Um, and there are a few of those songs that are really useful to have in the back pocket go on what are they um don't back in anger's definitely one of them helps another one um yeah. uh take me home country roads that's that's oh, a- <laughs> oh right and you know it's, it's quite a sort of disparity of of, of styles there but for some reason yeah, something yeah. contained especially in the choruses of course of these songs that just grab people and once you once you you know once you have them you've got them for the whole rest of your your tenure and, and the rest of the night. So, so have you have you done these kind of sets where the landlord says, all right, son, there's a stool in the corner, <laughs> go and sit <laughs> on that and disturb the peace of these drinkers by playing some songs. Yeah, the- absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's kind of sort of how I figured out to, to get the attention of a room, I suppose, because, you know, if you don't, it's a really horrible experience. <laughs> You've kind of got no choice but to make people shut up and listen somehow. Um, and you, you so do, how do you do that? You play louder. Well, there is an element of that as well. There is an yeah, element you of see. how you conduct yourself, you know. Um, Which can be very people, annoying if you're on the receiving end of it. If you're trying to have a meal. <laughs> so maybe you're out in a restaurant and suddenly you suddenly hear somebody tuning up, you think, oh my Lord. <laughs> but <laughs> American Pie is interesting because nobody's got a problem with Don McLean. If you play the Bob Dylan song, you know, there'll be certain people who just think, oh, I kind of either subscribe yeah. to Bob Dylan or I don't. But he doesn't divide anybody, Don McLean. It's just a great yeah. song. But what, what you discover as well is that, you know, people do respond to the, the way in which you conduct yourself. And what I sort of observe watching various singer-songwriters do their thing sort of slightly coyly in uh, uh, various pubs across the land in the old world was that, um, you know, there's there's no, with a lot of them, there's no projection there. And, let, and you have to kind of, you have let, to puff your let's chest. Let's be out. more simple. Let's be more simple about this, Alex. Let me, let me cut to the chase. Yeah. Are you saying they don't speak to the audience? Absolutely not. It's all about... That's the the problem, problem. isn't it? You know, they're they're not there to entertain. And, you know, that's what you... You realise that you're not not there for you. You know, you're there to to add something to someone's evening. And, you know, um, and of course, you know, it's playing songs they know, songs they know they like, but also making them feel like they're being entertained. But it's Uh, also making that... And where where speaking is really important, I think, is it makes them like you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> it is kind of the conversation with the, with the room. A, and, yeah. and you're the compare as well as, as, as yeah. well as concern. And you have to stand up. I always play standing up. I never play sitting down because I find it really difficult when I'm on the other side to to really be bothered about someone who's just sitting hunched on a stool, you know, playing. That's true. That's, that's so true. true. They don't look like they're involved or making an effort or projecting or anything. That's absolutely true. There's, the, there's no authority there. And, you yeah. Know, um. So, but yeah, Don McLean, American Pie, it's, 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 it's a magical little piece. You know, you, the, the, the downside is you have to memorise 25 verses. Um, but, you know. Do you know who, in my experience, if I had to throw on anybody to play for your life in front of the most hostile pub or, you know, of the least impressed gathering of people, and I've seen them do this, uh, is, is Neil and Tim Finn. Uh, variously of crowded house, split ends, whatever. And the reason is, I've asked them about this, they're absolutely at ease. You know, you stand up anywhere and play a couple of songs, look the audience in the eye, get them singing along, all that kind of stuff. And they say, we always had to do this at family parties when we were like eight years old. They just learnt that's how you do it. 
that's how you entertain. And it never leaves people. But that's true of people like Ray Davis, isn't it? McCartney, all those guys. They kind of grew up with sitting around the piano with lots of, uh, you know, pints of mild bouncing up and down on the top of it, singing along. McCartney, for example, all all that early footage of the Beatles, he's eyeing everyone, you know. he, he He knew exactly what he was doing. But it's also playing family audiences is is a really interesting discipline because you're dealing with people who are from wildly different you know, age age ranges and interests and whatever and your job is to bring them together not to play them your interesting new song yeah yeah which is <laughs> which is the kind of indie well, way <laughs> I tell you the other thing about the other thing about about live music and unlikely contacts and I was told this by a, a friend of mine uh who's a very senior RAF officer who used to organise a lot of these kind of things in Whitehall um, uh, receptions, drinks receptions, where it was decided to be a good idea to warm the room a little bit with a little bit of live music. He said, "I have discovered through bitter experience that there is only one instrument in the world that you can't make too loud, and that's the harp." Interesting. He said, so he always used to hire a harpist to play in the background of drinks reception because you simply can can't never dominate. They can't true. dominate. Every other instrument, Johnny Musician's natural instinct is just play slightly louder. Well, I would suggest that perhaps the ukulele could be... Brown. Okay. But you uh, could still crank it up, though, can't you? You can still turn up the volume, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I suppose this notion of entertaining, you know, I, I guess it's translating into records now more than it ever has. Done. I, you know, I'm seeing various grassroots artists releasing their ballads. And I just think, why? This is 2020. Nobody wants a ballad. The, the very last thing I want at the moment, apart from having my actual eyes gouged out with a spoon, is to listen to a ballad. I want to listen to stuff that makes me happy. You know what I mean? I mean, do you think that we're going to see less? Balladry, you know, in 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 a big <laughs> in the next year or so. Because- yeah, when we when we reemerge, blinking in the into the daylight, it would be people sitting on stools saying, "Here's a song I wrote during lockdown," and the audience would just think, "Oh, bugger it!" I'll get the there bar. won't be any of that. <laughs> there simply were nobody's going to want to be reminded of it. Are you they? Hear about someone singing about their pain? Not in twenty. You, you, no. you care, do you? you? I mean, it's a, it's just completely bonkers that people are still convinced that other people want to hear about them getting dumped. In, in, a, in a year that an actual global pandemic's happened and, and the Pentagon's confirmed well, it's a, hey, well, OK, I, I give you that. But you see, going back to your point about speaking, yeah. I think I think people can be made interested in all kinds of things if you tell them. If you would say, this is a song I wrote about a girl who I went out with when I was 19 and she was called, oh, wait, make up a name or whatever. And this is what happened. And this is, she left me at a bus stop or whatever. They're hanging on your every word. If you no, told that's them that. true. Absolutely. They're really interested. Yeah. And they li- they listen to the song with completely fresh ears. Whereas if you just play it, they won't work that out. Yeah. I think you know, saying, they you know, think, here's the fundamental problem with musicians. They think the music is enough. That's it's it. not. I think, I think the misconception is with a lot of, a lot of musicians is that, you know, this piece of music, the emotional gravity is so powerful. As soon as, as soon as, as soon as I start playing this, people will just drop drop whatever they've got in their hands. Listen, wrapped, and but it doesn't happen like that, does it at all? Do you know the the great the great gift of Bruce Springsteen is not the individual songs, is the it's the knack of welding together the songs into a giant story, yeah. all the way through through the show. It's telling a story. Some of it's funny. Some of it's tragic. Some of it's new. Some of it's old. But it's all a narrative. Everything. It's not. And you can go and see Bruce Springsteen. You can go and see Bruce Springsteen for the first time in your life and be involved in that. You yeah. don't have to have followed him all the way through. No, no, no. I, I guess going to a Springsteen gig feels like you're at a big. You're at his party, doesn't it? In a, in a well, way. well, he it's always a theatre. He always says he wants it to be. He said this for years. It, uh, it's supposed to be a party. It's supposed to be a political rally. It's supposed to be a religious meeting. It's supposed to be a dance. It's supposed to be all those things. Got it, all that stuff together. And uh, but it, he really understands that business. If you, if you tell somebody something about a song before you play it, yeah. they're listening. Yeah, don't tell them afterwards because they missed it. Then, you know, it's it, you can it say all- the same about DJs. 
the best DJs are the ones who say, I'm going to play you this record. And look out for what happens. Two minutes in, you'll hear the most extraordinary sound. Yeah, and Try how, look at what that instrument how is How rarely do you hear that? I know. I know. Very rarely. Very rarely. As something, well. something, look out for this extraordinary thing. It's yeah. about to happen. Yeah. You have their attention. No, it's a story. No, definitely. So, uh, what else in any other business, Alex? What have we got? Any, to new, any new patrons? Yeah. Anything we're going we to talk, talk about? Yeah, so we, we have a we have a bunch of new patrons actually this week. Oh, um, good. So uh, and these are all annual patrons. Oh, um, we love nice, them. good. Of course, if you subscribe annually, you get um, a, a generous fifteen percent discount. Um, and also, and- we shin down your digital drain pipe to celebrate your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's my favourite sentence. Your digital half. That's we right. slide down, down your. your di- we're down your. Come di- down your chimney. If you have a, yeah. if you have a birthday between now and Christmas, we'll actually come down. We'll abseil down your digital chimney, and, and rummage through, through your old records. <laughs> Probably pinch something. Go on, yeah. Alex. Go. So we have uh, Bishop Brian Jones. <laughs> really? Okay. All right. Fine, Bishop. A real bishop. Uh, I, I, I like to think so. Yes, I do too. Um, well, I look forward to seeing the purple when we get round to his uh, the, uh, uh, his birthday. The indefatigable Nick Fuller, <laughs> indefatigable the marvelous Charles Kennedy, of course, Thanks. Sir Peter Hackett, absolutely. Uh, the magnificent Claire Nestor, right? Hello, Claire. Fantastic Robert Fincher. Yeah. Hurrah. Hello, Robert. Hurrah. Mr. Finley Napier. Oh, very good. Lord what a great Paul name, Hyam. Finley Napier. Lo- Who was the last one? Paul Hyam. Paul Hyam. Excellent. Well, well, it's very, very nice to have them all on board. We, we have a few more as well. Uh, we oh, have right, William Maguire, Sean Nubley, Stephen Price, and Kevin Butterworth. No less welcome. welcome Terrific. Well, I'm very glad to have them aboard. And uh, truly good news. Uh, and they'll be uh, getting access to all the stuff we do, all the word in your attics, um, all the, all the, they can attend and be in the room when we do further crowdcast chats we with all the, 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 the book videos that we're going to be doing. Over. We're going to be doing. Uh, oh yeah, we've we've chosen our ten our ten music books of the year, which we we'll, we'll have a link to that under this, uh, and there's a page where you can learn all about them. And uh, we're going to be doing little videos about each individual one in the next few weeks. And if you're a Patreon supporter, you'll get early access to that. So basically, the way it works on Patreon is you get everything and you get it first and you get it in vision if it's available in vision uh, in return for your much valued support. Um, Anything to add? (laughs) I think we're there, are we? (laughs) On that long and rambling discourse, I think we're probably there. Okay. Very good. See you next time. Bye-bye. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. (laughs) 